Hi everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer, and welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show. And we're not live today, um, because I am traveling back to the archive. So, um, yeah, so we watch old 16mm films, and we're going to start off by watching a video. <laughs> this is, um, these next two films are about uh, space stations. And the first one is about the International Space Station. And I believe it came out in 2001. Uh, and it is kind of a progress report about how things were going. Uh, and it's called the International Space Station, The Vision and the Mission. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next one, which is a longer film. And it's weird. It's a very weird film. It's about the future. It's about uh, them traveling to uh, this main character traveling to the space station, which I believe is called Libra. And it's kind of like a it's a film. It's about overregulation of the government. And it's a very libertarian film. And it is it's such a weird film. Like I, I've watched it several times. It's made by the people that made Chickenomics. Uh, and the uh, where they explain the free market economy using the San Diego chicken, <laughs> and um, it's it's you know it's really well done. Um, it has a big budget, um, but it's just so strange. And I've tried to find out more information about it, um, but I haven't been able to find any references to it uh, and what the point of it was. And like you know, showing it, there's usually program notes. That say like, well, this is what we're trying to point out. But the, what is clear is that overregulation of the government has made everybody's life miserable. And there's a utopian uh, space station where uh, there isn't government oversight. Uh, that's how I think I remember this. But um, <laughs> so it's, I got this film on eBay. I love that I have it. But it's since it's on the longish side, I, I haven't really shown it yet, so I'm happy to show it to you guys. Um, thanks for tuning in. We will be back live tomorrow. Uh, if you like what you saw, hit the thumbs up, uh, hit the subscribe. Uh, you can go to avgeeks.com and see other things that we've got going on, um, and DVDs, and we have a 24-7 channel. You can donate at patreon.com slash avgeeks or ko-fi.com slash avgeeks, and you can buy us some coffee. Um, otherwise, everybody have a great rest of your Tuesday, and I will see you again on Wednesday live. All right, everybody take care. Enjoy.
It is a new era for space, a new way of thinking, a new way of achieving goals, and it is working. The road to building the space station is not easy. The task is grander in scale than any previous space effort. No single nation can accomplish it alone. The challenge is met by 100,000 hands from 100 different locations around the world. Building the elements on the ground and having them meet in space, piece by piece, creating a station without borders. A complex chain of space missions brings it all together. A Russian proton rocket, the same design once used in the space race, now joins the effort launching the first piece of the station. As one piece launches, another rocket is prepared for the next flight. The versatility of the Space Shuttle has proven to be an invaluable asset to space station assembly. It brings hardware, supplies, people. The station will see steady traffic. The Space Shuttle and spacecraft from different nations share the task of constructing and maintaining the outpost. The station parts are delivered to the construction site, 230 miles above the Earth. Hard hats are traded in for space helmets as astronauts and cosmonauts team up to do the hands-on task of assembling the station. From hooking the giant station parts together to creating a network of power and data by tending to the smallest detail. Components from the United States, Italy, Russia and Canada, built with different technologies, have already been connected to function as a single entity. More are on the way. Like the hardware, people from different countries work together as a team. Crews already call the station home as they carry out their missions in four-month increments. Visible in the night sky, the station is a constant reminder that international partners have learned to work toward a shared vision. In pursuing that vision, there will be rewards, rewards that strive to touch the lives of all humankind. The International Space Station provides the only working platform for long-term science in space. Above the Earth, virtually free of the pull of gravity, everyday phenomena reveal their true nature for scientists to study. From basic physics to the smallest proteins of the human body. The benefits of reaching beyond our planet are already woven into our daily lives. Those benefits can only continue and intensify with a full-time scientific presence on the International Space Station, where we will take a new look at our own planet from above and strive to learn ways to improve the lives of everyone there through scientific research. The station also calls to the next generation of scientists and engineers, offering them new possibilities and challenges to consider and encouraging them to join the ranks of those who dare to dream. This may prove to be the most important reward of all for building the station. So we have a vision that one day when the world looks back on the International Space Station, they will see one team accomplished a legendary mission because they learned to work collectively and operate as a team every step of the way that through integrity, trust, and respect for people, that neither continent, nor ocean, nor language, nor cultural differences, nor technology will keep us from being successful in building the International Space Station, a world-class research facility, and a bridge to the future of human spaceflight.
Questa è la Stazione Spaziale Internazionale. Questa è la Internazionale Raum Station. Questa è la Stazione Spaziale Internazionale. Questa è la International Space Station. Politicians engaging nations in wars against the will of the people, increasing worldwide poverty and starvation, inflation, high unemployment, staggering crime rates, skyrocketing costs of nationalized health care, overpopulation, inability to meet your energy needs, bankrupt cities, bankrupt states, bankrupt nations, and morally bankrupt people. I still think you're being unreasonable. But, well, let's get down to it, huh? Whew, damn, it's cold. Phew. And it'll be just my luck that this is one of those days that the Planning Commission won't let us have any heat. <laughs> There's Alex. Hey. Alex, hey. good to see you. Alex. Did you have a good trip? Pleasant. Good. Howard. Alex, good morning. Hi, right, Howard. How are you? Fine. Good to see you. Oh, Jim. Good morning, Alex. Oh, the coffee is on the sideboard. Now, oh, I believe you all have had the chance to uh, analyze the investment potential of this proposal. <sighs> Robert, can't we turn the heat up just for an hour or so? No way. Well, all right. You know, the fact that this is a somewhat unusual investment consideration for us should not muddle the issue. What we want is a good return and a uh, reasonably safe investment. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? A reasonably sound investment is exactly what I've been talking about for the last... Hold it, Jim. Now, Robert, let's go at this uh, in an orderly fashion. The proposal before us specifies the parameters for financial backing to build additional space habitats similar to Libra, thus allowing for the expansion of their solar power companies as well as their other industries. The exact figures and contractual details are presented in the reports before you there, including the projected profits. The whole thing isn't feasible. Feasible? Jim, it exists. Now what we're interested in is expansion and profit. You know what I'm talking about, and you know why I'm flatly opposed to the whole project. Our options are limited enough as it is without taking on so many political ifs. We're asking for trouble. Jim, we've been through all of this before. This Libra thing is a fluke. It can't last. Look, I've examined this proposal long enough to be convinced there is sound potential for profitable investment here. I understand Jim's concerns. Certain interests are beginning to get a little nervous. If Libra expands, these certain interests will undoubtedly get even more nervous. Why don't we table these discussions until I return from Libra? And while I'm in outer space investigating the Morris Industries and Dr. Chin's solar enterprises, the rest of you can tickle the tiger's tail here on Earth. <laughs> Come in. Good morning, Edgar. Hello, Keith. Good of you to get here so quickly. Well, it's nice to be in a warm office for a change. You know, every other place in this town is freezing. Some exceptions to the rationing plan are necessary. Yeah, I know what you mean. Have a seat. What's up, Edgar? I've just learned that JP's gang is trying to put together quite a deal. Oh, really? What kind of a deal? A deal to expand Libra's energy production. Hmm. 
What's the bottom line? He's going after 100 billion. 100 billion? Do you realize what that means? Of course I know what it means. Uncontrolled energy. Cartel boys will be on us like tigers. We made a deal with them, and it was firm. Well, they're certainly not going to stand for unregulated competition. That's right. That's why this makes your trip out there doubly important. They must have some skeletons in the closet, huh? <laughs> well, who doesn't? You know, I'll be seeing all the key people, uh, Chin, Morris... You know, it is very essential that you really score some big points out there in your TV debate with Baker. Don't worry. I can take care of Dr. Paul Baker. Okay, it's just that it'll be on international TV, and I'm told he's not exactly a pushover. No problem, Edgar. The man has no practical political experience. You know, before he was made head of their government, he was, uh, he was just some professor somewhere. Okay, but he has got to understand that they have to submit to our regulations. He can be persuaded to understand. I'll see to that. Yeah, but you know, I'm not convinced that we have economic jurisdiction in space. If we don't, we'll get it. your attention please if you will turn to the central viewing screen you will now see our introduction to Libra a space community where residents work raise families and enjoy living living and floating around in that glorified beach ball and they call that living the illustration on your screen shows the exterior design of Libra residents live in the central sphere a rotation rate of approximately two revolutions per minute provides a gravity like force which varies from zero gravity at the poles to full earth like gravity at the equator inside the sphere the land forms a big curving valley rising from the equator to 45 degrees on each side the land area is mainly in the form of low-rise terrace apartments shopping walkways and small parks with grass and trees a small river flows gently along the line of the equator. You will notice the small scale of things, but for the 10,000 population, there is more than adequate recreation. You know, I've been a world senator for 10 years, not to mention my time as a member of the International Planning Commission, and I've been to a lot of exotic places. Bengali, Kuwait, Sri Lanka, you name it. But I have never before in all my days been sent to study space colonies. The sun's rays are reflected by large mirrors through windows into the sphere. The angle of the mirrors may be changed, simulating the day and night cycles. Producing an Earth-like environment complete with trees, birds, and rivers has proven more difficult than expected. But Libra's pioneering advances in environmental research have proved to be of great benefit to the Earth's ecology. You know, it's their conceit that bothers me. They portray themselves as some kind of rugged individualists. Oh, hell, it was government-supported schools and programs that led to the technology that put this casino they call a society into space. Yes, but it was the market economy that put the technology to work. Cheap source of water. Libra's economy is based on the engineering advantages of manufacturing in space. Building large structures in the weightlessness of space is very much easier than trying to do the same thing on Earth. In space, you don't have to worry about things coming apart that aren't firmly fastened together.
Further, these space structures can be expanded with virtually no limit to their eventual size. The automatic beam builder fed by rolls of strip aluminum and extruding beams continuously builds immense platforms miles or even tens of miles across in space. Libra's major industry is still the delivery to Earth of abundant, low-cost solar energy. Solar power satellites, panels of solar cells several square miles in area, capture the full-time sunlight of space and turn it into electricity. This energy is then beamed down to Earth as microwave radiation. On Earth, the microwaves are converted back into electricity again. It is important to understand that solar power on Earth is limited by the atmosphere and cut off every night by the Earth's rotation. Libra's government is small, democratically elected, but strictly limited in its areas of responsibility. The current head of the government is Dr. Paul Baker, former professor of market philosophy at Stanford University. That concludes our overview of Libra. We hope you find the information useful during your stay. You know, what's fascinating is that these communities weren't built by a government. I heard they were started by a bunch of real pioneers. High frontiers <laughs> must have cost a fortune. Mm, but the first ones have already paid for themselves. Libra. <laughs> Bottom line isn't the only issue. Oh, Jim. Excuse me. Although I have read the Libra proposal, and I have an understanding of the economics of it, apparently I'm not familiar with the complete background. May I inquire as to how this project got to Alex, I, I'm sorry. But I think that Jim's and my personal disagreements may have clouded the issue. So let's get down to it. Robert. Well, about 20-some years ago, 1978 to be exact, a group of major investors was formed under the management of a Miss Ann Morris. They... Oh, boy. <laughs> Here we go again. Just a second. JP, do you have any matches? Right, Robert. Good, thank you. Anyway, they put together and financed a project to create a, a somewhat unique solar power industry. Unique in that once in operation, they utilize material from space to build their satellites, thus avoiding heavy lifting from Earth. That's the biggest factor in their profit potential. Then, because of the necessity for larger and more comfortable living quarters for the workmen, engineers, scientists, and their families, they've developed a living habitat that orbits in space around the workstations. This Libra is amazingly like Earth, and reportedly quite satisfactory in terms of living enjoyment. And this project was controlled by your government, I assume. No, the Morris Group just went ahead and did it. I have no idea how they got away with it. Just plain guts. Just plain insanity. No. You know, Senator, I'm really looking forward to this. Personally, I find the whole thing ridiculous totally without a rational and comprehensive plan. Senator, do you know where we change our money to their currency? Uh, I was told they do it any place. Hayek. It's a strange name for money, is uh, it? Ladies and gentlemen, we are now in our final approach to Libra. We hope you've had a comfortable flight and that you'll enjoy your stay in Libra.
recommended the Rogi Hotel to you as well. I suppose it's all right. I would imagine. Is that the transportation we're supposed to take? I guess so. Good to have your feet on solid ground. I'm serious, Howard. I'd watch any investments you might be considering out here. They've totally lost touch with reality. They're actually dealing directly with consumers. They're not going through appropriate government channels, and that can't go on. So far, everyone seems pleased. Except those appropriate government channels. Howard, it's a complex situation. There's more to it than that. Hmm. I'll bet there is. What is not being considered is that when this thing started, when this Libra thing started, government regulations were insignificant compared to today. It's just plain ludicrous for any group of rational people to think that the business climate today is as free as it was in 1978, out in space or not out in space. Perhaps you are right, but these uh, profit figures are interesting to my consortium. Could we go over them again? This is what we have. Since the project was undertaken, there's been a total capital outlay of $49.8 billion. $50 billion, 1978 dollars. 20 years of inflation has more than quadrupled that. Oh. Mm. Well, at least that $50 billion paid off. They're not sitting around in the dark. Remember the 1978 budget for the Department of Energy? It was over $10 billion. And that was for just one year. Since then, the taxpayers have dished out over $500 billion for inept conservation schemes. And that didn't even include the candle. Well, Howard, I would love to take time for a drink with you, but uh, I've got to get down to some very important business. And I've got that TV program coming up. So you told me. Well, I have an interview to get ready for myself. Good luck. Thanks. And Howard, don't you forget what I told you. But Dr. Chin, I see all that has been done here, and I'm so discouraged about the way it is on Earth. There are solutions to our problems. Solutions from Earth, not just from space. But there are so many policies. Tariffs, taxes, over-regulation, nationalization. It all seems to stifle new development. It's like, well, why don't people see the real problem? I want to do so much, and I want to do it on Earth. Come on. There were so many times on Earth when I, too, wonder, wonder if it was all really worthwhile. I saw countries like yours going deeper and deeper into debt to pay cartel prices for oil, even back then as we were plunging into the energy and food crisis. A frightened world turned to a, a no-growth policy, a static state, like, like animals fighting over one water hole. Stricter and stricter rules for allocating resources, ever stronger enforcement powers, eventually a totalitarian government. And then, and then of course, a static state is forced in self-defense to suppress new ideas. There can be no room for, for ordering one's life as one pleases. No place for intellectual curiosity. No new horizons. Good morning, Morris Enterprises. May I help you? Miss Morris is in the But I interrupted. You were talking about how you got involved. Oh, yes. Well, when I was in New York, I got to know a young physicist, Dr. Chin, and became acquainted with a lot of people involved in the space concepts. Students on campus, scientists, government and industrial research people, and certain businessmen. I became convinced that solar power satellites manufactured in space, eventually from space materials, could provide enough cheap energy to give the Earth some breathing time and make a profit for investors. I was excited about doing it as a 
private enterprise venture. But it wasn't as easy as I thought. Oh, getting the upfront money was hard enough, but, but living in space was nothing like you see it now. In the beginning, we had to lift everything from Earth. But that was so expensive. Both the Earth and the Moon sit in what are, in effect, gravity wells in space. But the Earth's gravity well is 4,000 miles deep. That's how far you have to throw something to get it off the Earth. But the Moon's gravity well is 200 miles deep. So throwing things off the lunar surface is very much easier. That's where the mass driver came in. Using solar power derived from generating stations on the day side of the moon, the mass driver is a type of electromagnetic catapult. It's able to throw small parcels of raw materials from the surface of the moon out into space. Then these bundles are caught up near our workstations. Of course, no one had ever done this back then. But now it's... It's all turned out greater and different than my wildest dreams. Dreams that kept me going through those rough and difficult stages. It all seems so slow. Generator plants with radiator panels attached are 350 meters long. But largest of all are the huge solar mirrors. Once unfurled into orbit, nearly four kilometers across. Four kilometers? Yes, and each power sat has four or five of them. And yet, four kilometers is small compared to the ones we're building now. Dr. Chin, has your work made all of this possible? Alone, all the scientific knowledge in the world could not make all of this happen, Carmela. No more than alone, $50 billion could have made it happen. It's the release of creative energy in an atmosphere of freedom that has made this possible. Of course, having the sun continuously at our disposal helped. Yes, it's very right, here. Oh, what the heck is this? That's Abacus. Abacus. Abacus is one of the most popular consumer information computers on Libra. These computing systems will give and receive information when you want it, where you want it, and in the style you want it. Uh, how does it work? Or is this a he or she? It's an it. It's an it? When a man's voice activates Abacus, it answers in a man's voice. But when a woman asks the question, it answers in a female's voice. People seem to like that. Interesting. Now, if you have any questions about products or services, anything from oh, toothbrushes to a doctor's qualifications, it can probably answer you better than I can. And in any one of four languages. Want to try it? Sure. Well, let's see. Have you bought anything since you've been on Libra? This watch, I picked it up at the hotel. Mine just seemed to give up. Let's ask him it. If it thinks I made a wise choice. Oh, Abacus won't... Uh, what kind of a watch is it? Uh, Astro. Astro 500. Abacus? Ready for input. What can you tell us about the Astro 500? Astro 500. Features hour, minute, second, day, month, solar readout, stopwatch, six digital calculator readout, warranty, 25 years, suggested retail price, 20 high X, complaint rate, high, 23% in the last three months. My God, it looks to me like whoever runs this has a real thing going. You pay off the testing companies, buy a good rating to give to the various computer services. Simple. Not simple. If one of these testing companies were dishonest, it would become apparent very quickly. 
either through the products they endorse being terrible or, and this is much more likely, another testing company wanting to prove that they were more reliable. With this kind of information so easily available, no business is likely to gamble away its credibility. Already, most governments either own or control the energy production business. Oh, and look at what a great job the government has been doing for it. Efficiency has nothing to do with it. These governments won't allow this space thing to produce cheap energy without being controlled. I'll bet my last cent that the fertile minds of the world planners will produce regulations and the means to implement them that will effectively uh, sink this, this dreamy-eyed project. You know, Jim, I'm really getting sick and tired of all of this haggling. I, for one, am not afraid to take this project on. Now, that's my kind of thinking. Jim, what's the investment world come to? Uh, they're afraid of their shadows. You know, I remember... I remember, sure. Spirit, sure. But those days are gone. We're no longer children believing in such freewheeling, ego-centered games. Oh, so much for Emerson's self-reliance. Justine, you make me sound like... Look, I'm just being realistic no matter what you think. Libra is, is like the Titanic. It's a self-sustained habitat floating in the ocean of space. The International Planning Commission and their bureaucratic bodyguards are hell-bent to plan an equal distribution of the world's resources, which, of course, they will control. That is the iceberg. I, for one, have no desire to invest in the Titanic. <laughs> You said there have been a lot of complaints lately about the Astro 500. Which watch should I have bought? Freecision, 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 Freecision. How much does that one cost? A Freecision isn't a watch. It's a free decision. Abacus is an objective type of consumer computer. It will give you information given to it by several testing laboratories accurate information that you will need to make your own decision. But Abacus won't make it for you. It can't decide what's best for you. That's your free responsibility. Responsibility. Well, that's not a bad word. I know. It's what's been attracting more and more regulation refugees from Earth. Give me a close-up on the senator for his rebuttal. Stand by. Five, four, three, two. Uh, you were saying, Dr. Baker, that we've made a mess of the energy problem on Earth. I disagree. Now, I admit that what you've achieved out here with your solar energy production is a remarkable technological breakthrough. But what it needs now is a comprehensive international plan. We are planning the energy needs necessary for the survival of our world. No nothing as important as this can be left to mere chance. Any potentially disrupting element must be taken out of the control of selfish, private interests and given a planned direction. Do you think all of this could happen without planning? That is precisely the point. People here are free to plan. You talk about selfishness. You wish to legislate your energy plans into the lives of others. You believe your thinking is the clearest, your logic the most irrefutable. If this isn't oppression seeking to legislate your particular mind comp on other people, then I am unfamiliar with the definition of the term. Oh, free people make mistakes. We have made some and undoubtedly will make others. But yes, you make mistakes. We can't afford to make mistakes. A system! You don't have any system. The crux of the matter is this, Dr. Baker, and I mean this sincerely. We are intelligent enough to know that we cannot administer a world society by primitive notions. My God! A world society of over six billion is so complex that only the most sophisticated planning can cope with its problems. But wait. How well are your sophisticated plans working? You've been at it for decades now. No mistakes, 
the perfect system? Look at the record. Face it, your world is falling apart. Politicians engaging nations in wars against the will of the people. Increasing worldwide poverty and starvation. Inflation, high unemployment, staggering crime rates, overpopulation, skyrocketing cost of nationalized health care, inability to meet your energy needs, bankrupt cities, bankrupt states, bankrupt nations, and morally bankrupt people. These are the results of years and years of your planning. This is the record. I would like to comment on this no growth planning Jim has been talking about. I feel this is where our attention should be focused. I have here the latest report from the International Planning Commission. Oh, I've seen it. I'd like to hear that. I haven't either. Let me read from their concluding statement. Quote, This commission's proposal is oriented not toward the supply of abstract economic services, but toward the, but toward the satisfaction of human needs. Abstract economic services? Now, what does that mean? And how in the hell do you satisfy human needs? food, clothing, housing, and energy by ignoring the economics of production. No one gets any if there isn't any. How much energy is really needed, and how much should it be allowed to substitute for human labor, thus producing unemployment? Then they're saying we're going to have more employment if we have less energy? They're saying, and not so subtly, that energy-consuming machines do the work of four or five, sometimes 50 men, thus putting them out of work, replaced by technology. Same old myth that should have been exposed 50 years ago by the mere fact that it doesn't work that way, never has and never will. Nonetheless, that's what they're throwing at us. Ah, yes. But to go on. We should make every effort to supply energy only in the quantity needed for the task at hand, and not to use up energy for unnecessary purposes. And who decides? You know, they might say that a meeting such as this is an unnecessary use of energy. Now, do you see what I mean? Too much energy from Libra or any place else is a threat to their plans, to their reason for existence. It takes away their power base. Too much energy puts the commission out of commission. Good. I think it's time that their game plan is upset. We well, must know by now Libra got the money. Every newspaper in town is full of it. That and your undevastating performance in the debate. What the hell happened to you out there? You made a fool out of yourself. Not really. But now, Edgar, you have to understand. I thought you understood. I understand that two and a half billion people watched the silver-tongued senator put his foot in his mouth and the IPC with it. I was trying to make a point. <laughs> well, you made a point, all right. You made a point of not making any. Forget about the debate. Now, what about Chin? Did you get anywhere with him? Will he cooperate? In a nutshell? Uh... No. Doesn't he understand? He thinks he does. What does that mean? Roughly translated, he thinks we stink. He feels we're not concerned with meeting the energy challenge, that we're on an ego trip, and that we're concerned only with saving our own necks. Well, that's absurd. He also tried to give me a lesson in economics. Huh? Self-righteous moralist. What about Morris? Same thing. Very polite, but wouldn't budge. You know, she's really rather smug. I don't know where her unbridled optimism comes from. And her plans for the future are unbelievable. You know, you really should hear some of the things... In other words, you got nowhere with anyone, right? I wouldn't say that. Never mind. The point is, JP's gang is launching a campaign to discredit the IPC's entire existence. Now, some of the energy companies are getting nervous. You might say, very nervous. Well, I don't see why. The whole world knows why energy producers must be controlled. They won't buy some upstart disrupting things with uh, irresponsible production. Don't kid yourself. 
Everybody loves the scrappy underdog. Now, the media is already smelling a story. They're falling all over each other to try and get the first scoop. You bring them in line. Divert them. Okay. But how? You know... Don't butt me, Senator. Do it. And bring that Lieber gang into line also. They'll refuse. And there is no... Taxes, Senator. Taxes. We can tax them right out of existence. We can't tax a nation in space. At least I don't see how... What is wrong with you? Protective tariffs. We slap a tax on Earth's receiving terminals. Make Libra prices more expensive than the cartel prices. They'll soon come in line. And if the terminal owners refuse to pay? Senator, not paying taxes is illegal. We can force them to pay. And if they do pull any funny stuff, well, the black market is illegal also. We still hold the one important card. The legal force of government. Well, Edgar, I'm just not so sure.